Okay, I believe we are live. Hello, everyone. My name is Gary Mengel, also known as Ardwolf on this channel, and I am here with representatives and members and students of the Georgetown University Wargaming Society to talk about how to play war games specifically, but you could play other kinds of games on the Vassal Engine. So I um, believe everyone can see my screen at this point, so let's get right into it. Um, obviously, online play of board games in general and role-playing games and other kinds of games but analog games um, has become much much more popular over the last six or eight months or so for reasons that I don't feel that we'll need to go into um, those of us who are lucky enough to have a lot of face-to-face -face opponents maybe have not necessarily needed a tool like Vassal to engage in play online um, but others have, and there are a number of such options available right now, the most popular of which are either Vassal or the Tabletop Simulator, which is a thing that's available on Steam. It's a much more 3D rendered engine uh, device that we will not be talking about in any detail, but there are some other older uh, alternatives as well, like uh, Aid to Camp and Cyberboard, and there are some game specific applications uh, like Warboard, I think it's called, for a World at War and things like that. So I'd like to welcome the, uh, the YouTube community to the chat. Um, as well. And if anybody has any questions, I will be getting to the chat. Please ask in the chat and I will be getting to those questions as I'm able to in the course of the discussion. So when we start talking about Vassal, what is Vassal? Vassal is an application using which you can play tabletop games virtually. Um, primarily, uh, one uses it for board games, but I have seen and heard of people using it for miniatures and RPGs too. I'm not sure I see the use of that myself, but that's just not my bellowick. So um, it is a software program that is built with Java, which essentially means that it will run on just about any piece of hardware as long as for that hardware you have a Java uh, virtual machine, um, which does mean you can run Vassal on handheld devices like tablets and phones, but the interface does not really work. So it is not recommended by either myself or the people who are developing Vassal. Um, that is something that's supposed to come down the line, but it's, it doesn't really work right now. Um, so let's get started. And the first thing that we want to do is actually to install Java. Um, now my recommendation, you don't have to do this, uh, we want to Google for this in a specific way, so we're going to uh, we're going to search for Java for operating systems, and we're going to get th this link, this Java downloads for all operating systems link, and this will provide you with the downloads for your operating system, provided that that operating system is either Windows, Mac OS, Linux, or Solaris. Um, I do recommend um, if you are on a Windows or Linux machine that you install the 64-bit version of Java. Um, it will uh, help to eliminate performance issues that are later down on down the line, and I'll, I'll we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. But we're going to install, and this is going to run as a standard Windows installation, um, the 64-bit version of Java. So I'm basically going to click on this, download it, and, and run the installer. If you are on a Mac, that is still fine. You're just going to be limited to whatever, whether this version of Mac, <coughs> uh, Java for Mac is 64-bit or 32-bit. I'm not sure. It could be 64-bit. Um, the only difference that you'll find is that there's a specific number that will set in the Vassal um, preferences that will essentially be the amount of memory that is allocated to Vassal. And if you're on 32-bit Java, then that limit will be relatively low. So you may end up having performance issues in larger modules. In most modules, it will not make a difference. But I recommend using 64-bit Java if you can. So let us assume then that we have installed 64-bit Java on this machine and move on to the next step. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, so the next thing we are going to do 
is to download the Vassal Engine itself. And we are going to navigate our way to vassalengine.org. This is the sort of hub of where one gets um, Vassal and modules for Vassal, which we'll talk about shortly. There are Vassal modules available on other sites as well due to a variety of reasons. Um, but often, at least, they are linked from this website. And we'll talk about how to find modules and all that stuff. So we're going to just download Vassal 3.4.3 for Windows 64-bit. Okay, it's not commonly downloaded. So <laughs> Windows Defender is telling me it's dangerous. And we'll keep it because it's fine. Okay, so then I'm just going to run this piece of software. I'm going to run it anyway because I know it's fine. All right, now if you have a uh, Windows Application Guard on, you'll get this pop up box. We'll just run it again. And then we'll get a setup dialog box. We're going to set it up. Um, you can absolutely set it up using the standard option. I will choose custom just so we can see what it looks like. Um, mostly what it uh, gives me the opportunity to do is just say where Java is. In, it's it, where Vassal is installing. So I'm going to pick a location. We'll do this location. Okay. Now, I will point out something else too well well we're talking about installing vassal and that is that if you are going to upgrade to a new version of vassal i recommend you uninstall your current version of vassal first and then reinstall uh, the new version because vassal uninstalls dirty it does not uh, uninstall the old version what it does is it installs a new version in a new folder which takes up more drive space um, for no reason whatsoever, and your existing module bookmarks inside the client will not may not work properly. So I recommend just uninstalling it and installing it again cleanly. So we'll just say, um, we'll call this Vassal Test, and we'll hit Next, and it's going to install, I don't actually want any of those things. Okay, and then it's going to be done, and I can run it if I want. I'll uncheck that box because I'll show you where to run it from. So on a Windows machine, this, this might be different if you're on a uh, Mac or something like that, but on a Windows machine, I can go to that direct that folder um, and just click on or double-click on the vessel.exe ex executable. Um, you can also right-click on it and set it to, say, you could pin it to your taskbar or pin it to the start menu. I have it installed to the start menu personally. Um, so I'm just going to double click on it. And it's going to open up. And you're going to see that I have a lot of modules loaded in here already because I spend a lot of time with this application. However, one thing that you will want to do if you have 64-bit Java installed underneath the Vassal client is click on the file menu up here. This is before you open any modules. Click on preferences. And then you're going to get a little dialog box. On the importer, you'll want to increase these, initial, these Java initial heap. JVM stands for Java Virtual Machine. And what that is, is that's basically the, the thing that runs the Java program. It's a program that's running on your computer that is then itself running the Java application that you're running. Um, and you want to assign it more memory than, than Vassal wants to uh, out of the box. Uh, I like it at 1024 and 2048, but if you have 32-bit vas, 32-bit uh, Java, you will not be able. It will not accept limits that high, and you'll probably have to set it to say 512 and 768 or something like that. And we'll want to make a similar change inside a module. So um, we have at this point completed our Vassal installation and setup. Does anyone have any questions so far? to send out the tweet that I should have sent out 10 minutes ago. 
Um, okay, so we're going to now say to ourselves, okay, so we have Vassal installed. That's fantastic. What do I do with it? I would like to play this particular game with Vassal. How do I do that? So let's assume for a moment, just because I'm familiar with the module, that the game we're looking for is Holland 44 from GMT Games. Um, on the vassalengine.org website, we will click on modules from the menu up at the top. And we can search for it or we can do it the slow person's way, which is how I always do it, which is to click on the first letter. In this case, we'll click on the letter H. And then we'll just scroll down until we see Holland 44, which is right here. And we'll click on that. And this will take us to the module page for Holland, the Holland 44 module. Okay. Um, for many modules, um, there will be multiple versions of the module available. And it doesn't really matter which one you use, except that if another person is actually going to be playing this game with you, you absolutely want to be sure that you are using the same module version and Vassal version for that matter. Um, so just make sure that you're using the same one and you'll be okay. So we will download. I will save link as. Put this right in here, and we're just going to save this uh, .vmod file. Now, let me show you something else, because at some point, someone, some bright youngster at Microsoft decided, wouldn't it be a fabulous idea if we hid the file extensions for files? I think that's a terrible idea, but I'm a computer guy, so I, you know, I, I have a reason to think that way. Um, so if you can't see the extensions, the .exe or dot vmod as it were and you would like to in this is in windows 10 you can click on the view tab up at the top and then just make sure that file name extensions is checked and that will display the file extensions um, and there's some uh, there's some tricks that you could do with vassal modules that that you need to see the file extension to do so which i don't know if we'll get to or not um today but all right, so we have the module installed, and you'll notice that Vassal itself is an .exe file, which means it's an executable program, and the vmod module file for Vassal module is uh, its own. I don't want to say proprietary, but it's it's a it's a Vassal specific file extension. So I am going to I will right click so you can see it. Right click and select open. And what is going to come up is I am going to see uh, this welcome screen. Um, this will, the first time you open a module up, um, you will see this uh, enter your name and password bo uh, dialog box. You can put anything you want here. I, I have a, you know, thing I put. Um, you're not signing into anything when you... Um, fill out this information. You do not need to register at the Vassal site to download anything or anything like that. You can. There's a forum that if you register on the site, you can post on the forum and that kind of stuff. But that's not necessary. You don't have to do it. I was using this for years before it even occurred to me to do that. So you can just put your, your name, um, whatever password you want, and then repeat that password. And this is just if you want to lock down a, a module or a session, you, this will be the password you use to get into it. And it will also, this name will be the name that shows on the server browser if you're browsing for online games. So we will just hit next. Now it's going to give us a couple of different options here. And we're going to circle back to this a couple of times. We can either start a new game offline, we can look for a game online, or we can load a saved game. Okay, let's take the simplest of these options and just assume, hey, I have this new game, Holland 44, I want to push the pieces around, see if I can figure it out. So no, no other human is going to be involved at this time. So we'll just start a new game offline and we'll just hit next. It will now ask us for setup information. Now this is where we have to start mentioning that mo the modules themselves are not designed by some central committee or something like that. They're designed by volunteers that um, just want there to be Vassal modules for this stuff. There are some publishers that, that actually have people assigned to this task, but by and large, 
the modules are designed by uh, not professional module designers. And therefore, there's, there's the set of standards by which the Vassal modules are designed are fairly lax, right? There's some really common features and some modules won't have them. Um, there's no common set of keyboard shortcuts, for example. So every module is going to be somewhat different in terms of how it actually functions once once you are in it and you have the module open. So bear that in mind. And there is sometimes a significant learning curve. Some Vassal modules are essentially a board and pieces that you can move around and that's it. And other Vassal modules have a substantial amount of automation where some of the combat calculations might be done for you or there might be a chit cup where you can draw chits from that cup or a deck that you could draw cards from. Um, and that all varies by game and by module. So in this case, we'll just pick the campaign game because I know what the setup looks like. And we'll select next. Now I got I have to pick a side. This is another thing that um, will vary by module. There are some modules that do not have sides. Um, a, a properly designed module, however, will have sides. So that, for example, the, in this case, the German player cannot move the allied player's pieces and so forth. Uh, but you can almost always join as an observer. I am theoretically going to do this solo, so I'll just select solo at this time, and we'll click finish. And it, of course, opened up on the wrong screen, so let's move it over. All right, so here we have the map for the game Holland 44. This is, if you don't know, a simulation of Operation Market Garden in September of 1944. You should all watch the movie. Uh, that will be your homework assignment for this session, if you haven't seen A Bridge Too Far already. Um, so we have a representation of the board, and on that representation <coughs> of the board, we have a representation of pieces that come with the game. Okay, um, You will probably find, at least unless you have an enormous 4K screen, which I don't, um, that you'll probably need to zoom in a couple of steps. Um, there is sometimes in some modules a hotkey to zoom in but it's again not standardized so um, for anyone by the way who's having trouble following along um, the entire video will be available on the youtube channel um, later so you'll be able to go back and watch this again if you like um, so zoom, having zoomed in, and I just used the, the icon up here on the menu, some of these, we'll talk about this in a moment, some of these icons are standard to Vassal, um, some of the other icons are unique to the module, most of them are unique to the module, uh, but we can see that we have the counters and pieces from Holland 44 in here, and we can simply left click to select a piece, we can move pieces back and forth. We can just click and hold to move pieces. Um, if there is a stack of counters, this is one of the things that um, <coughs> Tabletop Simulator is less good at. We can mouse over the stack and it will pop up a little box that will show us the contents of the stack. Um, some modules have a built-in fog of war function where it won't show you the contents of enemy stacks. Uh, this we're in here as, as solitaire, so that doesn't apply in this particular case. But we can even look at these. There's a turn record track down here, and the units on the turn record track are those units that come in on those dates as reinforcements. So we can mouse over these stacks and get a good sense of what's in that stack. Um, we can also double-click on the stack to expand the stack a little bit, and that will, in theory, let us pull out individual counters that we can either click on so we can see them more closely or move them out of the stack and put them elsewhere. Um, there is, generally speaking, no rules enforcement in Vassal. That is up to the players. Um, sometimes the player aid cards and game charts will not be... Okay. Um, sometimes the player aid charts and game aids will not be in the module and you'll need the physical pieces to do it. That's a relatively common decision for a vassal module designer to make um so but sometimes they are sometimes these things are incredibly complete but in, in no case that i'm aware of is there real rules enforcement here so it's, it's up to the players to do that um so we've covered opening up the module moving pieces around um it works exactly like you think it does i click and hold on a piece and move it to a hex and i can i can move it in steps one hex at a time, 
Um, there is also an undo button up here so that I can move things back. This is an enormously helpful um, tool, and that is standard to Vassal. And all modules that haven't actively disabled it uh, have that undo button, which is good. Because if you're like, oh, I just messed that up, you can undo and fix it. Um, another thing that is uh, this show hide the server controls button is a standard Vassal uh, button as well, but you normally won't need it unless you're already in an online game, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and you found that the server display is in the way and you can hide it. Um, all these are module specific buttons, and then these down here are the standard Vassal module navigation. So you can, for example, click the camera icon to save a PNG image of the entire map with counters on it. It'll save, it'll save it as a single layer image as far as I'm aware. Um, you can zoom in, you can zoom out. And there's usually a select zoom which lets you do things like fit width. So you can fit according to the width of the map or to fit uh, visible which will zoom to the entire map but again unless you have an enormous monitor uh this is typically or the map is very small typically that's not terribly useful um and usually there'll be a fit uh height as well which in this case works out to be exactly the same as uh, fit visible um there will normally be a globe sometimes these icons look different because module designers decide they want to put their own cute little icons in there um you can let's zoom back in here so we can show you Sometimes you'll be like, okay, so what's the terrain here in these these Eindhoven hexes? Um, you can click this hide all pieces on this map icon to hide all the pieces so you can see under them. Uh, and then this one. Uh, so not all modules have an overview window. Uh, this is not a feature I have used very often, um, if ever, to be honest. Uh, I don't know if how useful this is. Like I said, I... I don't think I've ever used it, uh, but it's there. You can use it if you want. Um, and then, now you notice, if I move these pieces, uh, one of the sort of built-in functions is that once I've moved a piece, it's actually flagged as moved so that I can see, oh, I haven't moved these pieces yet, or I have moved these pieces. This button right here, the mark all pieces on this map as not moved, removes those little moved flags from all the pieces on the map, okay? Um, all right, so uh, that's basic inside the module navigation, how to move pieces around, that kind of stuff. Let's look at Holland 44's specialized screens. Um, this is another button that is a standard. This will this says allow other player to take your side. So it, you can actually switch sides. So let's say you're playing a solitaire game, but there's a fog of war element. You can actually switch sides. This will let me pick any side that is currently available. Um, so I can pick the Allied side, for example. And that re-registers me as being on the Allied side. And this particular module doesn't stop me from moving opposing pieces. Um, that is a very significant and important button for certain modules in certain games. For this one, it doesn't appear to be particularly useful. We have built-in die rollers. Uh, we have, in this case, we have a 1d6 roll, which will give me a 1d6 roll. And it will... Uh, it will register that roll, its result, and who rolled it in the in the log. So I wish actually there was a way to pop this log out. Um, that would be a useful feature, but it, it is not one that is available. Uh, I can also roll a 2d6, and, and this varies by module as well, right? There are games that use d6 or 2d6 or 3d6 or 6d6 or d10s or percentile or whatever. Um, this is something that is set up by the module designer. And apparently it's really easy because I've never seen a Vessel module that doesn't have the built-in die roller. Uh, this button right here is to show or hide the markers palette, which is this little uh, pop-out box. Um, a lot of times you'll have to expand these windows a little bit to make them useful. Um, and these are just the standard game markers that are available. And you can just drag these markers off the display in, onto the map. Um, I'll also point out that some Vassal modules automatically center the pieces in the playing spaces on the map, whether those are hexes or squares or whatever. Not all modules do that. Sometimes you can just put, 
counters willy-nilly wherever you want. Um, okay, so that's the markers window. Uh, this hex icon here gives us the player aid cards, which pops up um, this particular display, which has, you'll see that it has two tabs on it, a pack one and a pack two. And that's just the two different sides of the player aid card for Holland 44. Um, sometimes this will be insanely elaborate for games that have 50 player aids. Um, Holland 44 is a relatively straightforward game. It has one double-sided player aid. So this is pretty much everything you need to run the game off of right here. Um, and most, I'd say most Vassal modules do have that, but you'll find that some don't because there are concerns whether they are justified or not in some cases about people who are not going to buy the games and just play with the Vassal modules. I know of no one ever who has actually ever done that. But uh, it's I, it's some a concern that some people have and is the rationale why sometimes things are left out of the module and you need the physical components. Uh, the next icon here is a, another common type of thing is the setup card. Um, now Vassal, the, Vassal uh, Holland 44 specifically has setup cards for its scenarios. So when you are setting the game up, you can lay out all the pieces on here and then put them in these hexes. Um, in this case, I can... And this, these right here uh, are randomly placed in uh, hexes on the map. So, and that we should. Can I? I feel like it should be uh, giving me the reverse side on those particular pieces. But um, so I can basically draw random chits from this pile and put them in each of these hexes as part of the setup okay but all all the pieces would normally live on this setup card except that in this case um, the vassal module has given us the campaign setup but let's say that you want to play an alternate scenario such as has appeared in a c3i magazine um, you could do that with uh by doing the setup yourself um so that's that. Uh, the next one is called AL Inventory. And this is a function that I always like to see because what it does is you can click on this little button next to each thing and you can find individual units on the map. So you can go click on this to expand it. Click on Main Map and you'll see we have British. Uh, CA is Canadian? Yeah, maybe. Uh, Dutch, Polish, and U.S. So we can go find uh, this Canadian unit, and you'll see that we, when we found it, it's on the reinforcement track, actually. Let's look for some British First Airborne, because those those should be on the map. So, and you can click on these uh, units here, which is, you know, zoomed all the way down to the bottom of the tree. Um, should be every unit in the game. If this will click by clicking on these uh, entries here, it will take you to where that unit is. So sometimes, it's especially at a bigger game, you might just lose track of where something is. If a module has this inventory function available, and not all of them do, um, you can use this to find those mysterious lost uh, pieces. Um, the next item is the Combat Markers Palette. This is just like the other Markers Palette. Uh, except that this doesn't give you stuff that's uh, available in the physical game. This is just something that the module designer thought would be happy, would be helpful to have these like little odds markers that you could put on the map for the combats in case you want to do all that in advance. Um, and then you have similar ones for the combat results table results. And for your DD in this context means uh, determined defense, which is a feature of this particular game. Um, so that's just more markers. Uh, this one is to remove all the combat markers. So say the turn's over and you want to clean it up. In addition to clicking on this moved icon to remove all the moved flags, um, you can click on this button to remove all those extra combat markers that you... Um... Huh. That is absolutely a new... I'm just looking in on the, the YouTube chat. Um... Andy says control mouse wheel does zoom, and he is absolutely right. That is a new feature 
that was not the case historically and it was pretty frustrating to not be able to control mouse wheel and zoom so that's awesome Thank, way to go vassal team all right um so moving along does anyone have any questions we're almost done with this particular segment So if we just mouse wheel without control, that actually pans us up and down the map. Um, all right, and then most modules have this notes feature available, okay? Um, and what this allows us to do is take notes in the module and then those notes are saved with the saved game. Um, and you can set scenario notes, which are visible to everybody, public notes, which are visible to everybody, private notes, which are, invis which are visible only to you, and delayed notes, which are only visible to you until you reveal them, at which time they become visible to everybody. Um, this is a cool feature I have found, and this may be module dependent, I have found this the, the delayed notes to be insanely flaky. Um, I will also point out that you just need to click on save a lot here. If you just type stuff and then you save the game, you won't necessarily have saved your notes. You need to click save on the save on the notes window as well. All right. So that is basic vassal navigation. Any questions? Okay. Let us close this module. If we have moved any pieces, Vassal will ask us to save the game or not. And if we if we, we save it, let's save it, actually. So it's just going to pull up a... And I, I have created a folder for my Vassal saved games. Uh, we can just hit save, name it, whatever we want. Uh, it will give you a log file comments so you can write in, like end of turn two, for example. However, uh, to prevent me from having to paw through multiple files and load the module every time, I will typically put this kind of note in the file name so that I know that this particular save file is the save file from the end of turn two, for example. Um, so we can hit cancel. All right, so we're gonna go back now to the vassal, the main vassal window. And let me close this because I think we're done with it. I am going to open, let's open the module for, well, let's do Talon 44 again, just because we've, we've already explored it a little bit and we know what it looks like. Now, this window will come up and you'll notice it's not asking us for a name and password this time. It's merely asking us whether we want to start a new game offline, we want to look for an online game, or if we want to load a saved game. Um, the last two options here are kind of interchangeable in that you can either load a saved game um, and then run it online, or you can look for game online and then load your saved game. So we'll, we'll approach it from the latter standpoint. We want to play an online game with other humans. So presumably humans anyway. Uh, we want to select look for a game online and we'll click finish. And then I will, I will get again the vassal window but it doesn't look like the module is open right um what it looks like now is that we have the header of the module open but the map isn't open yet and that's because we haven't actually opened the scenario yet we merely have the module open so in order to create a new place a new room as vassal calls it to play the game in um we're going to create a new room. So we'll call it GUWS, and we'll just hit Enter, and it will automatically put us in that new room. And it will show here that there is a, game, a room for this game called GUWS, and that I am the only person in it at this time. All right, now at this point, I can click on File, and I can select new game or load game or select any of the scenarios that are available in the module. Um, I, I guess I should say that many Vassal modules contain all of the game's actual official scenarios, but not all of them do. Some of them don't. Some of them have just the campaign game. Some of them have just a blank setup and you have to do all the setup yourself. So let's open the campaign game. 
And once again, it is going to give me this dialog box. And I'll join as the German side in this case. Now we have the actual scenario open. Okay. Um, so someone else is now free to, and I'll, we'll show you how to do this in a moment. Uh, someone else is now free to join this room of Holland 44, and in so doing, they will be joining this game. And when they attempt to do that, Vassal will ask them what side they want to join as, and because we are already in as the Germans, it will not give them the Germans as an option. Okay, So I've opened a new Vassal session here, and I am going to... Uh, it's not really going to work, is it? No, it's not going to. We'll have to do it a different way. Didn't quite think that particular aspect through. Um, all right, so we have started an online game. I'm going to close this and now join somebody else's online game. So on the right-hand side of the main Vassal control panel, uh, by the way, every module that you have opened since you're installing Vassal will be listed here. So you don't actually have to go to the file a second time. You can either double click or you can right click and select open module. Um, if you've moved the file or something, that can create issues. Uh, on the right-hand side, however, you will... And there, there is, by the way, no way to uh, sort this or put it in folders or anything like that. That's another feature that we're still waiting for. It would be very useful to be able to do that. Uh, it's just a big list. Uh, anyway, on the right-hand side, uh, we're going to see server status. And I'm going to hit refresh. And let's just maximize this. So what we are seeing here is that is all of the Vassal games that are being played online right now. And we can see that, in fact, there is somebody playing Holland 44 in their main room, and there's two people playing it. Um, it's, I think, I'll, let me talk a little bit about protocol here. Um, it's considered... Uh, not desirable to join somebody else's room and definitely uh, it's okay but you definitely don't want to start moving pieces around in somebody else's room let me put it that way um by the way vasl means virtual advanced squad leader and it is the thing that uh vassal evolved out of this was originally just supposed to be something that um was for ASL and it got adapted for other games and in many cases non-war games now and you can see that there are actually 13 people playing the World in Flames Collector's Edition right now uh, I'm going to open up um, let's see I bet I know who this uh, ID Jester what, uh, what room do you uh, have open what game Thank you, and welcome everyone to the chat, by the way. I haven't had a chance to say that. We're 40 minutes in. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of games going on here, which is perhaps not surprising. But they're not all war games either, right? So here's a game of Gloomhaven. Um, here's a game of uh, Guerrilla, which I consider not a war game. Um, Jimbo's Dealer's Choice game, whatever that is. So okay, so ID gestures running Holland forty four. So okay, so we're gonna click on uh, click on this room. Well, let's go to file. Well, let's open the Holland forty four module. Let me put it that way. All right, we're gonna look for a game online. Okay, and now you're gonna see there's this main room, and I can join the room except I already joined the room so by clicking on this apparently yeah all right so at this point now I can click on file load game and I can load my test game which will load the setup And this is the game that we saved earlier. So you can either um, select a scenario 
to start a new game, or you can just load your uh, existing save game file at this point. Okay, so one other thing that I'm going to mention is the preferences inside the individual module. Okay, each individual module is going to have uh, a preferences screen too, and you're going to get to it by again going to file and clicking on preferences. Um, and again, you're going to have this JVM Java Virtual Machine initial heap size in megabytes, and it will be set to this pretty low number for many modules, uh, and and for for a lot of users of Vassal, probably all the modules that they're ever going to actually work with. Um, these numbers are actually fine. They won't cause any problems, but I'll increase them because I can to 512 and 768. Um, and again, those number limits will be higher, substantially higher, if you're on 64-bit Java, uh, which is why I've installed 64-bit Java, because unlike probably most Vassal users, I sometimes run modules that are really, really large. Um, and the performance of those modules will be atrocious if I have not increased this Java uh, virtual machine memory allocation in both Vassal and in the module itself. Um, I can think of multiple examples where that's the case, but m most people probably don't encounter it. But um, So again, uh, and I think I said this early on, if you don't want to deal with 64-bit Java, uh, and just want to just install the whatever default Java 32-bit application, it, it's probably not going to be a problem. But bear in mind, for a large module, um, you're, for, a, for a large game, typically, you're, you might run into performance issues uh, related to that, and you won't be able to fix them uh, in these preferences uh, without reinstalling Java. So... Um, and then the rest of this stuff, you can change your name and password. Um, you can change the preferences in the chat window, in the log window, I should say. Um, there is a function here called center on opponent's moves. Um, what that will do is that will reset the camera when your opponent is moving. Some people really like to have that on. Uh, it it really it kind of depends on the game too. Some people prefer that to be on. Some people uh, become insanely aggravated if that is on and keeps moving uh, while the other guy's moving. You're trying to look at your pieces, and uh, that will keep resetting the camera. And it's it it can be irritating. I personally prefer to keep it off. This is where you control it if you would like to you would like to turn it on. And I think by default, I think by default it's off. Um, so I'm going to turn it off. All right. So um, we have one other thing that I would like to talk about, and that is playing by log files. Um, so does anybody have, before we get to that, does anybody have any questions? What we have discussed so far is relevant to playing either by yourself at home on your computer or live with other people who may who are in a vassal room to play that game. But what if you are trying to play by email? Obviously, some games are suitable for this and some games aren't. Um, but some games are very suitable for this. And sometimes some pairs of players will have difficulties um, getting both people online at the same time. So they'll choose to play by mail instead. Um, I'm going to close out of the module. And we'll talk about... Hey, Gary, about quick question. Yes. So if you are playing, um, let's say by mail, and mm -hmm. you're trying to do a, a series of different attacks, how do you know which dice rolls are to which attacks? So I will. We'll, we'll show. I'll show you that in a moment. That is right. that is a great question, and that is exactly where I was going. So let's again um, start with Holland Forty Four. I'm going to load a saved game in this case. I'm going to load the most recent saved game. Okay. And it's going to, it keeps pulling the module over to the wrong screen for some reason. All right. So I am going to play you, Sebastian, in Highland 44, and I'm going to make the first move. 
Um, so I'm going to actually hop in as the allies. Okay, I'm in as the allies, so that's good. Because the allies have the first move here. I mean, I'm going to make a bunch of moves. But first, I'm going to click on File. And I'm going to select Begin Log File. Okay? Now I'm going to say, I'm going to call this the Turn 1 Log File. But you can call it whatever you want. Okay? And I'll hit OK. Now, we'll just do a couple of moves here. I'm going to zoom in. And I'm going to say, okay, this unit and this unit, or this stack and this stack are going to attack this stack right here. Okay? And I'm going to roll the dice to resolve that attack. All right? And then this is eliminated. I can right-click, by the way, and go to Combat Results and hit Eliminated, and then that will send it to the dead pile. Okay? And then I'll do it my advance after combat. All right? Now I'm going to go to File, and I'm going to End Log File. All right? That log file is what we are going to send back and forth, okay? Not the, the vsave file. So let's open up. Let me close the module again. And now I'm going to open this turn one log file. All right. Okay. Now, you see this icon right here. This is also page down. What this will do is, this will take me through each of the things that occurred. All right. So we've really all I did was undo when it doesn't didn't log the movements. Okay. Well, I can now. Um, Having done these moves, I can now say, um, in the chat, well, let's go to the end of the log file. Okay, so we'll start a new, I'm doing, I'm being disorganized here, I apologize. Uh, we'll start a new log file. So we'll do, we'll do log file two. Okay. And we'll make these moves. That's a German piece. Okay. And then I'm going to zoom in a little bit and get a hex number. If I actually mouse over this, you'll see that it, it's actually showing me the uh, zoom in on the counter, but it's also showing me the hex number 1409. So I will make a note in the file here. Attacking hex 1409. And then I will roll the die. We roll the five. We'll look it up. Let's assume this is eliminated. We'll go to combat results eliminated. And then let's say that's the end of our turn. Uh, often, by the way, um, when passing these files back and forth, you'll actually do that multiple times per actual turn, um, depending on the particular game in question. Uh, for some games, it becomes very Byzantine, in fact. And for, for our game of Atlantic Wall that I played in for some time ago, uh, we had just in, even in the uh, the like early airborne landing phases, we would have to pass the file back and forth to all four players multiple times. So we'll hit end log file. And then we'll hit load continuation, log file two. Let's say we have sequential log files. Now we've done that, we can step forward and it will actually kind of see the pieces are moving. It'll actually show me the, the replay on the screen and it will show me my commentary that I put in the log file. So um, if you are uh, passing the file back and forth in this way, you'll want to explain what you are doing as you go so that now I know that this result of five is a result of the attack on hex 1409. And some players will probably want to be very very detailed about that. They'll, they might want to say, I'm attacking hex 1409 from hexes 1408, 1309, or whatever. Um, uh, but that is going to vary by player. 
and and vary by the interactability of um, the game system. Um, in this case, um, Holland 44 is uh, a game system that is largely I go, you go. There is some ability of a defender to make decisions. So say, say a defender might declare determined defense um, in a specific hex, and you'd need to know that. Um, so you might have to pass, uh, you might do all of your movements, and then in the combat phase, you might pass log files back multiple, back and forth multiple times. Um, for obvious reasons, it's a lot easier to just have full players online doing this using Zoom or Skype or whatever you use. I tend to use Discord um, for uh, voice chat for this kind of thing. Um, and then, like I said, you'll merely pass... Where did those go? Uh, you'll merely pass these um, log files, these vlog extension files back and forth, rather than the save game itself. And then that will actually take you step by step through the moves that were made and any commentary that was made. All right, hopefully that does answer the question. Uh, do we have any additional questions? Because... Uh, at this point, uh, we have basically covered, uh, with, with caveats that include, you know, modules are different, right? I, I'll, I will show you another module just so we can see how different these modules can be. Um, let us load... Um, let's load it Never Snows. Um, just so that I can show you how different this module looks from the other one. And this is also a game about Operation Market Garden in September 1944. Okay, so we'll start, we'll start a new game offline. We'll hit next. We'll select a setup. We'll pick scenario 5.1, which is the campaign game in this case. And we will get a very demoralizing looking screen. We'll be like, whoa, where's the map? What's going on? Well... That's the map, zooming all the way out. Um, and this is this is a large, it's not a huge game, but it's a big game. It's a five map game. Um, it is a company scale simulation uh, to the extent that it is a simulation of Operation Market Garden. So you have all of Hell's Highway here and a bunch of starting units that will enter the map on turn one and a bunch of airborne units that will be landing on turn one, which actually takes quite a bit of time. But we'll see that the, the header bar across the top looks quite different from what we saw in the Holland 44 module. Um, some of these things are basically the same, right? This button right here is to show or hide the server controls. That's, that's the same. The redo uh, or undo and step forward buttons are still there, but they're grayed out because there's nothing to do in this case. Um, these mo these buttons at the end basically look the same. Here's a mini map feature, which again I don't know how useful that is, but it's here. Um, we have our remove the moved markers from the counters button and the hide units button if we want to hide the units and look at the underlying terrain. But everything else in the middle here is all different. So we have a unit browser, for example, that will show us all of the units in the game counter by counter. Uh, in organized in various tabs. Sometimes in some modules, these counters will be amazingly and thoughtfully and meticulously organized. And in other cases, it will be basically a, a giant pile of counters. And you'll have to find and become aggravated by trying to find the counters that you're looking for. This one is fairly well uh, organized. Um, the TNA is the artillery ammunition record track. This is a record track that you have to, you have to push counters around uh, in this particular game. Um, you have the terrain, whoops, the terrain effects chart showing all the different terrain uh, of this game and what it does. Um, we had one of those in Holland 44 as well. Here is a generic player aid that shows us the sequence of play and the combat table. Uh, almost, this is actually quite a simple, simple game system, even though it's a big game. And almost the entire game runs off this table, right? This card right here. Um, 
We have other chart. We just looked at that. We have a combat markers box that here's your KTX markers. What we call KTX markers. If we were playing a physical game, we might use these to mark units that moved or combats that are occurring or something like that. And we'll typically use tile spacers. Um, but uh, this module gives us a simulated tile spacer as well as various letters for whatever reason this is for. Um, here's a 1d6, 2d6, and 3d6 die rolls. So we can roll all of these. And this, this will give us a 2d6 plus 1d6, which is a common convention in um, this particular product line where you'll roll multiple dice of different colors in this case, you're rolling a 2d6. I think it's a 2d6 barrage attack. And then the extra 1d6 is uh, to see whether the barrage attack does uh, damage or not, I think. Uh, again, we have our notes feature, which will look exactly the same as it did in the other thing. This is a standard vassal feature. Um, we have a dead pile. If we... Uh, let's find a unit. Let's right-click on... this guy send it to the dead pile he will pop up in this dead pile which is, appears to be a picture of some actual cemetery in the netherlands um used targets so this is for the barrage system of this game which is a little bit different um setup markers um so this is for your scenario setups um if you have we'll zoom in and i'll show you So this stack, for example, will set up within six hexes of this particular location. So these setup markers are to show that, that uh, there's some discretionary things that have to occur um, when setting this particular scenario up. Um, and we have the setup displays. And these, again, represent the actual counters and formations that are fighting here. Um, in this case, the airborne divisions, because it's the campaign setup, the airborne uh, airborne companies will actually drop in the first turn. Um, so they are set up here on the display. And of course, they, except these Polish who will come in at a later time, uh, the British and Americans will, will, will drop in the first turn. So they, and they will drop from this display onto the map. But here's that display. Um, there is a reinforcement display. This shows you, uh, again, what reinforcements come in and when. Uh, here is a display unique to this particular game, as far as I know, which is this airdrop and glider points thing. And I just got the game this week, so I don't know how this works and cannot explain it to you. Uh, but there is a display for this, and you could put counters on it if you wanted to by dragging them from elsewhere. Uh, and then you have German setup and a German order of arrival cards. And then you have uh, buttons on here that will, let's, let's uh, find a unit. I'm going to right click on this to get the right click menu or context menu. And I can mark this DG that's disorganized. That's a particular state that occurs in this game system. Um, I can click these remove allied DGs or German DGs at, say, the end of the turn to remove all of those status effects. Um, other right-click context things, I could mark it moved. Say if I moved it, I can also mark it unmoved by clicking mark moved again. Um, I can turn the movement trail on so that it will actually show me the movement path uh, for... This game, I don't believe that to be a useful feature, but in in, in some games, it's a very useful feature. Um, some games will give you... Oh, this actually does too. I don't know why. Uh, this will actually allow you to rotate the counters 30 degrees. Um, that is a convention that is sometimes used in playing with physical components to indicate that specific units have moved or haven't moved. Um, for example, when we are playing the Operational Combat Series games, we will typically pick a direction for that turn, and then any unit that is facing, where their counter is facing that particular direction, um, has been moved already, so that we know which units have yet to move. This is particularly useful in a game where you might have 400 counters to move each turn. Um, 
you could use this to reflect that, but Vassal also has the moved flag, so I think that's less necessary. I suspect that the rotate functions in here are inherited from a previous module that used it, and then that module was used as the basis of this module. That is relatively common. Um, it is particularly common for game families, uh, of which this is one. This is part of the standard combat series from the Gamers and Multi-Man Publishing. Um, a lot of their modules seem to have been built off of the old uh, Civil War Brigade series modules, which do use counter facing and which therefore need the ability to rotate counters. Um, that is not something I would normally do in this module, but I could, you know, I could see it theoretically being helpful if you wanted to uh, signify something different that wasn't signified with the moved marker. Um, all right, so we have seen, I think we have gone through the, the basic fundamentals of what this thing is and what it does, um, how to install it, how to load modules up, how to start an online game. Um, again, I will, uh, I'm actually saving the video here and will upload it as its own video so that those who are interested can look at it, the channel. Uh, for those who have not seen it, is Ardwolf's Lair, A-R-D-W-U-L-F. If you search YouTube for that, I will come up. Um, I will put this video up uh, for future posterity. And I figure uh, it was time for me to have done an updated uh, video on how to do Vassal anyway, because this is something that I had done years ago. But honestly, Vassal is, you know, I learned something here doing this today, right? This new feature that is a control uh, mouse wheel zoom that was not in here literally last week. So, or at least the last time I updated the module. Uh, so, with all this in mind, uh, I have run out officially of material. Um, so, if anyone, either any of the participants from the friendly neighborhood Georgetown University Wargaming Society or uh, from the chat have any questions, now is a good time to ask. Hey, I have one quick question. Hmm. Um, I wanted to remind you of talking about Vassal compared to some other systems like Roll20 or Tabletop Simulator. So I know that's something you wanted to discuss. Okay, yeah, and I mentioned that at the beginning. And I, I it's kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing here. Uh, but I could talk about that briefly. So what Tabletop Simulator is, it's a, is it's a 3D environment in which one can play tabletop games. And it's primarily been used for non-war game general board games, but um, it happens that there is very good support, thanks to a, a small number of, of really motivated contributors, for a number of old either Avalon Hill or SPI classics. Now, there are certain things that Tabletop Simulator is not as good at as Vassal, okay? One thing is that it... It, and not that it doesn't have its own strengths, it does. And I'll, I'll talk to that to the extent that I am aware of, although I'm a lot less familiar with Tabletop Simulator than I am Vassal. Um, it doesn't have the log file functionality, um, so you kind of have to have the people in the room playing it at that particular time. Um, it is not as good, although I think I heard that they are working on improving this feature, uh, at handling stacks of counters because you actually have to kind of click and kind of move counters around in a 3D space. And that can be a little bit clumsy if there are high stacks of counters. And, and I, high in this context meaning, say, three or four or more counters. Um, for those old SPI games, which often have stacking limits of one and there is essentially no stacking, um, that's not much of a problem. Um, for a game like this, where you might potentially have seven or eight counters in a hex, um, that could be an issue. <coughs> um, another thing that um, vast, that Tabletop Simulator as has going for it is, A, it's, it's relatively visually appealing. You can kind of customize your own 3D background. So if you want to, uh, to have your game table, your virtual game table, be in a quiet forest glen you can do that um or a you know an old oak paneled study uh, you can do those kinds of things um also you can just it's, it's relatively easy assuming you can navigate steam and the steam workshop it's relatively easy to install right um you install it from steam you start it up 
Um, you open, you subscribe to a mod uh, in the Steam Workshop that is the mod for that particular game. And then when you load the game up, you open up that module and that's it. Um, how the nitty gritty of joining online games in Tabletop Simulator works, I am absolutely unqualified to talk about. Um, Jim Ozarski, who is in the chat, or at least was, uh, I welcome your uh, forthcoming tutorial video, if you haven't done one already, on how to uh, play online games via Tabletop Simulator. That would be super valuable, and I would watch it with great interest, because some of those old SPI games are actually really cool, and the Vassal modules for them are extremely primitive. Um, another thing is that Vassal runs on... It, 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 so, Tabletop Simulator uses the Lua scripting language uh, to construct its modules. That's true. Uh, tabletop sim you have to buy Tabletop Simulator. Um, you can buy modules for it, too, for popular games, for, like, old war games. They're, you just download them off the um, the Steam Workshop. Thank you, ID Justa, for mentioning that. Because I paid for it ages ago and, and had forgotten that it cost actual green money. Um, so, the... Um, there's, there's more functionality can, in theory, be programmed into Vassal than in Tabletop Simulator. And that's been the case for those Tabletop Simulator modules that I've looked at. Um, sometimes, you, like some of the combat calculations or victory point calculations or stuff like that, will actually be automated in a Vassal module. I have never seen that in a uh, Tabletop Simulator module. That does not mean they do not exist. That just means that I personally have not seen them. Um, as far as, uh, Roll20 or there's another virtual tabletop, uh, that's primarily intended for RPG, uh, users, Roll20 and I can't remember the name of it, but there's, it's, so there's a free one, Roll20, and there's a one you got to pay for. Uh, which is available on Steam as well. You can buy it directly from them. And it's quite expensive. You basically, in order to functionally use it, you need to have like an unlimited license for it, which costs something over $100. And I am not a... It's expensive, right? For, for a piece of software you're not familiar with. Um, those, uh, both software packages are primarily intended for people playing role-playing games. They're... They do have like an online die roller and online character sheets built in and stuff like that. And I can certainly see certain types of war games being played on them, particularly something like Diplomacy. Um, that, uh, but but I, there's not a community of people playing board games on, uh, on those platforms that I am aware of. Uh, it, it would almost be like somebody playing an RPG, playing Dungeons and Dragons on Vassal, for example. I am positive that people have done that. I do not believe it to be a popular uh, course of action. Uh, ID Jester also mentions that Tabletopia, let's take a look at this actually. Tabletopia is a tabletop simulator type of application. And I believe it also costs actual money. Okay, so this actually has some online tutorials and stuff, so so there's that. Um, and has some very popular board games available on it. I can't really tell you anything about this. Um, it, I, It's not free, I can tell you that. And it looks well supported, but it's not, again, part of kind of my sphere of interest. So the games that are available on here are not games I'm terribly interested in playing. So I can't speak to it particularly clearly uh there's also war planner uh that's this thing warplanner.com uh this is a single game system tool to play a one particular game called a world at war which is published by gmt uh which is a uh, simulation very simulation of all of World War II in both Europe and the Pacific. Um, and it actually is looks, from what I've seen of it, looks very mature, but it, it only is used for that particular game system. So if you are the kind of person who would like to grab that game and absorb its entire 240-plus page rulebook 
um, then War Planner is something you may wish to take a look at. Um, I think that's about all I have to say on other options. Um, anyone, does anyone else have any additional questions? And I'm not, uh, let me, let me make a note, uh, that I am not, um, endorsing any of those platforms over any other, except to the extent that, uh, I personally have a lot more experience with Vassal and only because the people uh, the community of people playing the kinds of games I want to play are primarily using Vassal as their tool for this. And that's the reason why I don't do more with things like Tabletop Simulator, which I do have. Um, Hethwill in the chat notes that nothing would be playable if there were people making the modules. Yeah, that's that's actually true. And I, I've kind of mentioned that, but I'll, I'll circle back to that point. Um, there are individuals not associated with Vassal or Tabletop Simulator or whatever who are just, you know, interested individuals who are making the modules for these games. There are exceptions to that. Uh, companies that are, or designers who have uh, retained the services of a particular module designer to make a module for their game, that is an unusual situation that is very much the exception. Usually it is just an interested person who is sufficiently motivated to put a vessel module together, which I can tell you, having tried it, is uh, pretty far from zero work. Um, it is, in fact, a significant, for uh, especially for the kind of games that I play, it's a big task. Because um, you actually have to, you know, create and organize digital files for every individual playing piece, whether it is a card or a token or a counter or whatever. Uh, it is not zero work. Um, Tim Healy is pointing out that Vassal has fewer system requirements than uh, other options, specifically Tabletop Simulator, and that's true uh, also. I don't know what kind of cross-platform functionality is available for Tabletop Simulator. I don't know if there's a Mac client or a Linux client, for example. Uh, generally speaking, um, you can get your thing to run on a Linux machine, but the level of hoops that you may have to jump through might vary greatly. Um, Vassal has relatively light system requirements. You can easily run it, especially if it's a modestly sized module like Holland 44, for example. Um, you can easily run it on a junky old laptop. Um, whereas on Tabletop Simulator, it's you're kind of in this, it's a virtual 3D environment. You can actually run it in VR if you want to. Um, and the system requirements are, are significantly higher. They're not necessarily astronomically high. But if you don't have a computer that can do a least modest amount of gaming, um, I would be sli at least slightly concerned that Tabletop Simulator might be sluggish. Also worth pointing out. All right. Do we have any additional questions or comments that we would like to circle back to before we uh, sign off here? Because I think uh, we've, we've, uh, we've exhausted all my material, I can tell you that. Hey, Gary, before you end, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of Georgetown University Wargaming Society for putting on this tutorial for us. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's definitely my pleasure to uh, to have helped out. All right. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Sebastian and the Georgetown University Wargames, Wargaming Society for having uh, motivated me to, to conduct this session. Um, if anyone has any questions uh, after the fact, you're watching this after the fact, just make a comment on the, uh, on the video and I will answer those questions as best I can. I'd like to thank everybody for watching and all the commenters and viewers who stopped by during this session. And I would like to wish everybody a happy wargaming. <laughs>